for stopping by Sheila's audiobooks and I am Sheila. This recording is coming from South Texas. All stories on this recording are in the public domain per United States copyright law. This story is about The Big Four was first published in 1927. Framed in the doorway of Poirot's bedroom stood an uninvited guest, coated from head to foot in dust. The man's gaunt face stared for a moment, then he swayed and fell. Who was he? Was he suffering from shock or just exhaustion? Above all, what was the significance of the figure four, scribbled over and over again on a sheet of paper? Poirot finds himself plunged into a world of international intrigue, risking his life to uncover the truth about number four. The Big Four By Agatha Christie Chapter 1 The Unexpected Guest I have met people who enjoy a channel crossing, men who can sit calmly in their deck chairs and, on arrival, wait until the boat is moored, then gather their belongings together without fuss and disembark. Personally, I can never manage this. From the moment I get on board I feel that the time is too short to settle down to anything. I move my suitcases from one spot to another, and if I go down to the saloon for a meal, I bulk my food with an uneasy feeling that the boat may arrive unexpectedly whilst I am below. Perhaps all this is merely a legacy from one's short leaves in the war, when it seemed a matter of such importance to secure a place near the gangway, and to be amongst the first to disembark lest one should waste precious minutes of one's three or five days' leave. On this particular July morning, as I stood by the rail and watched the white cliffs of Dover drawing nearer, I marvelled at the passengers who could sit calmly in their chairs and never even raise their eyes for the first sight of their native land. Yet perhaps their case was different from mine. Doubtless many of them had only crossed to Paris for the weekend, whereas I had spent the last year and a half on a ranch in the Argentine. I had prospered there, and my wife and I had both enjoyed the free and easy life of the South American continent, Nevertheless it was with a lump in my throat that I watched the familiar shore draw nearer and nearer. I had landed in France two days before, transacted some necessary business, and was now en route for London. I should be there some months, time enough to look up old friends, and one old friend in particular. A little man with an egg-shaped head and green eyes, Hercule Poirot. I proposed to take him completely by surprise. My last letter from the Argentine had given no hint of my intended voyage, indeed, that had been decided upon hurriedly as a result of certain business complications, and I spent many amused moments picturing to myself his delight and stupefaction on beholding me. He, I knew, was not likely to be far from his headquarters. The time when his cases had drawn him from one end of England to the other was past. His fame had spread, and no longer would he allow one case to absorb all his time. He aimed more and more, as time went on, at being considered a consulting detective as much a specialist as a Harley Street physician. He had always scoffed at the popular idea of the human bloodhound who assumed wonderful disguises to track criminals, and who paused at every footprint to measure it. No, my friend Hastings, he would say, we leave that to Giraud and his friends. Hercule Poirot's methods are his own. Order and method, and the little grey cells, sitting at ease in our own armchairs we see the things that these others overlook, and we do not jump to the conclusion like the worthy Jap. No, there was little fear of finding Hercule Poirot far afield. On arrival in London, I deposited my luggage at an hotel and drove straight on to the old address. What poignant memories it brought back to me. I hardly waited to greet my old landlady, but hurried up the stairs two at a time and rapped on Poirot's door. Enter, then, cried a familiar voice from within. I strode in. Poirot stood facing me. In his arms he carried a small valise, which he dropped with a crash on beholding me. Mon ami, Hastings. He cried. Mon ami, Hastings. And, rushing forward, he enveloped me in a capacious embrace. Our conversation was incoherent and inconsequent. Ejaculations, eager questions, incomplete answers, messages from my wife, explanations as to my journey, were all jumbled up together. I suppose there's someone in my old rooms? I asked at last, when we had calmed down somewhat. I'd love to put up here again with you. Poirot's face changed with startling suddenness. Mon Dieu! 
but what a chance ipuvantable. Regard around you, my friend. For the first time I took note of my surroundings. Against the wall stood a vast arc of a trunk of prehistoric design. Near to it were placed a number of suitcases, ranged neatly in order of size from large to small. The inference was unmistakable. You are going away? Yes. Where to? South America. What? Yes, it is a drill farce, is it not? It is to Rio I go, and every day I say to myself, I will write nothing in my letters, but oh! The surprise of the good Hastings when he beholds me. But when are you going? Poirot looked at his watch. In an hour's time. I thought you always said nothing would induce you to make a long sea voyage. Poirot closed his eyes and shuddered. Speak not of it to me, my friend. My doctor, he assures me that one dies not of it, and it is for the one time only, you understand, that never, never shall I return. He pushed me into a chair. Come, I will tell you how it all came about. Do you know who is the richest man in the world? Richer even than Rockefeller? Abe Ryland. The American Soap King? Precisely. One of his secretaries approached me. There is some very considerable, as you would call it, hocus-pocus going on in connection with a big company in Rio. He wished me to investigate matters on the spot. I refused. I told him that if the facts were laid before me, I would give him my expert opinion. But that he professed himself unable to do. I was to be put in possession of the facts only on my arrival out there. Normally, that would have closed the matter. To dictate to Hercule Poirot is sheer impertinence, but the sum offered was so stupendous that for the first time in my life I was tempted by mere money. It was a competence, a fortune. And there was a second attraction, you, my friend. For this last year and a half I have been a very lonely old man. I thought to myself, why not? I am beginning to weary of this unending solving of foolish problems. I have achieved sufficient fame. Let me take this money and settle down somewhere near my old friend. I was quite affected by this token of Poirot's regard. So I accepted, he continued, and in an hour's time I must leave to catch the boat train. One of life's little ironies, is it not? But I will admit to you, Hastings, that had not the money offered been so big, I might have hesitated, for just lately I have begun a little investigation of my own. Tell me, what is commonly meant by the phrase, the big four? I suppose it had its origin at the Versailles Conference, and then there's the famous big four in the film world, and the term is used by hosts of smaller fry. I see, said Poirot thoughtfully. I have come across the phrase, you understand, under certain circumstances where none of those explanations would apply. It seems to refer to a gang of international criminals or something of that kind, only. Only what? I asked, as he hesitated. Only that I fancy that it is something on a large scale. Just a little idea of mine, nothing more. Ah, but I must complete my packing. The time advances. Don't go, I urged. Cancel your passage and come out on the same boat with me. Poirot drew himself up and glanced at me reproachfully. Ah, it is that you do not understand. I have passed my word, you comprehend, the word of Hercule Poirot. Nothing but a matter of life or death could detain me now. And that's not likely to occur, I murmured ruefully. Unless at the eleventh hour the door opens and the unexpected guest comes in. I quoted the old saw with a slight laugh, and then, in the pause that succeeded it, we both started as a sound came from the inner room. What's that? I cried. Ma foi! retorted Poirot. It sounds very like your unexpected guest in my bedroom. But how can anyone be in there? There's no door except into this room. Your memory is excellent, Hastings. Now for the deductions. The window. But it's a burglar then? He must have had a stiff climb of it, I should say it was almost impossible. I had risen to my feet and was striding in the direction of the door when the sound of a fumbling at the handle from the other side arrested me. The door swung slowly open. Framed in the doorway stood a man. He was coated from head to foot with dust and mud, 
his face was thin and emaciated. He stared at us for a moment, and then swayed and fell. Poirot hurried to his side, then he looked up and spoke to me. Brandy, quickly. I dashed some brandy into a glass and brought it. Poirot managed to administer a little, and together we raised him and carried him to the couch. In a few minutes he opened his eyes and looked round him with an almost vacant stare. What is it you want, monsieur? said Poirot. The man opened his lips and spoke in a queer mechanical voice. Mr. Hercule Poirot, 14 Faraway Street. Yes, yes, I am he. The man did not seem to understand, and merely repeated in exactly the same tone. Mr. Hercule Poirot, 14 Faraway Street. Poirot tried him with several questions. Sometimes the man did not answer at all, sometimes he repeated the same phrase. Poirot made a sign to me to ring up on the telephone. Get Dr. Ridgway to come round. The doctor was in luckily, and as his house was only just round the corner, few minutes elapsed before he came bustling in. What's all this, eh? Poirot gave a brief explanation, and the doctor started examining our strange visitor, who seemed quite unconscious of his presence or ours. Hmm, said Dr. Ridgway, when he had finished. Curious case. Brain fever? I suggested. The doctor immediately snorted with contempt. Brain fever. Brain fever. No such thing as brain fever. An invention of novelists. No, the man's had a shock of some kind. He's come here under the force of a persistent idea, to find Mr. Hercule Poirot, 14 Faraway Street, and he repeats those words mechanically without in the least knowing what they mean. Aphasia? I said eagerly. This suggestion did not cause the doctor to snort quite as violently as my last one had done. He made no answer, but handed the man a sheet of paper and a pencil. Let's see what he'll do with that, he remarked. The man did nothing with it for some moments, then he suddenly began to write feverishly. With equal suddenness he stopped and let both paper and pencil fall to the ground. The doctor picked it up, and shook his head. Nothing here. Only the figure four scrawled a dozen times, each one bigger than the last. Wants to write 14 Faraway Street, I expect. It's an interesting case, very interesting. Can you possibly keep him here until this afternoon? I'm due at the hospital now, but I'll come back this afternoon and make all arrangements about him. It's too interesting a case to be lost sight of. I explained Poirot's departure and the fact that I proposed to accompany him to Southampton. That's all right. Leave the man here. He won't get into mischief. He's suffering from complete exhaustion. We'll probably sleep for eight hours on end. I'll have a word with that excellent Mrs. Funnyface of yours, and tell her to keep an eye on him. And drive, Ridgway bustled out with his usual celerity. Poirot hastily completed his packing, with one eye on the clock. The time, it marches with a rapidity unbelievable. Come now, Hastings, you cannot say that I have left you with nothing to do. A most sensational problem. The man from the unknown. Who is he? What is he? Ah, Sopristi, but I would give two years of my life to have this boat go tomorrow instead of today. There is something here very curious, very interesting. But one must have time, time. It may be days, or even months, before he will be able to tell us what he came to tell. I'll do my best, Poirot, I assured him. I'll try to be an efficient substitute. Yes. His rejoinder struck me as being a shade doubtful. I picked up the sheet of paper. If I were writing a story, I said lightly, I should weave this in with your latest idiosyncrasy and call it the mystery of the big four. I tapped the penciled figures as I spoke. And then I started, for our invalid, roused suddenly from his stupor, sat up in his chair and said clearly and distinctly. Li Chang Yen. He had the look of a man suddenly awakened from sleep. Poirot made a sign to me not to speak. The man went on. He spoke in a clear, high voice, and something in his enunciation made me feel that he was quoting from some written report or lecture. Li Chang Yen may be regarded as representing the brains of the Big Four. 
he is the controlling and motive force. I have designated him, therefore, as number one. Number two is seldom mentioned by name. He is represented by ands with two lines through it, the sign for a dollar, also by two stripes and a star. It may be conjectured, therefore, that he is an American subject, and that he represents the power of wealth. There seems no doubt that number three is a woman, and her nationality French. It is possible that she may be one of the sirens of the demimonde, but nothing is known definitely. Number four. His voice faltered and broke. Poirot leant forward. Yes, he prompted eagerly. Number four? His eyes were fastened on the man's face. Some overmastering terror seemed to be gaining the day, the features were distorted and twisted. The destroyer, gasped the man. Then, with a final convulsive movement, he fell back in a dead faint. Mon Dieu! whispered Poirot, I was right then. I was right. You think? He interrupted me. Carry him on to the bed in my room. I have not a minute to lose if I would catch my train. Not that I want to catch it. Oh, that I could miss it with a clear conscience. But I gave my word. Come, Hastings. Leaving our mysterious visitor in the charge of Mrs. Pearson, we drove away and duly caught the train by the skin of our teeth. Poirot was alternately silent and loquacious, he would sit staring out of the window like a man lost in a dream, apparently not hearing a word that I said to him. Then, reverting to animation suddenly, he would shower injunctions and commands upon me, and urge the necessity of constant marconigrams. We had a long fit of silence just after we passed Woking. The train, of course, did not stop anywhere until Southampton, but just here it happened to be held up by a signal. Ah! Sacre Mila Tunnez! cried Poirot suddenly. But I have been an imbecile. I see clearly at last. It is undoubtedly the blessed saints who stopped the train. Jump, Hastings, but jump, I tell you. In an instant he had unfastened the carriage door, and jumped out on the line. Throw out the suitcases and jump yourself. I obeyed him. Just in time. As I alighted beside him, the train moved on. And now Poirot, I said, in some exasperation, perhaps you will tell me what all this is about. It is, my friend, that I have seen the light. That, I said, is very illuminating to me. It should be, said Poirot, but I fear, I very much fear that it is not. If you can carry two of these valises, I think I can manage the rest. Chapter 2 The Man from the Asylum Fortunately the train had stopped near a station. A short walk brought us to a garage where we were able to obtain a car, and half an hour later we were spinning rapidly back to London. Then, and not till then, did Poirot deign to satisfy my curiosity. You do not see? No more did I. But I see now. Hastings, I was being got out of the way. What? Yes. Very cleverly. Both the place and the method were chosen with great knowledge and acumen. They were afraid of me. Who were? Those four geniuses who have banded themselves together to work outside the law. A Chinaman, an American, a Frenchwoman, and, another. Pray the good God we arrive back in time, Hastings. You think there is danger to our visitor? I am sure of it. Mrs. Pearson greeted us on arrival. Brushing aside her ecstasies of astonishment on beholding Poirot, we asked for information. It was reassuring. No one had called, and our guest had not made any sign. With a sigh of relief we went up to the rooms. Poirot crossed the outer one and went through to the inner one. Then he called me, his voice strangely agitated. Hastings, he's dead. I came running to join him. The man was lying as we had left him, but he was dead, and had been dead some time. I rushed out for a doctor. Ridgway, I knew, would not have returned yet. I found one almost immediately, and brought him back with me. He's dead right enough, poor chap. Tramp you've been befriending, eh? Something of the kind, said Poirot evasively. What was the cause of death, doctor? Hard to say, might have been some kind of fit. There are signs of asphyxiation. No gas laid on, 
Is there? No, electric light, nothing else. And both windows wide open, too. Been dead about two hours, I should say. You'll notify the proper people, won't you? He took his departure. Poirot did some necessary telephoning. Finally, somewhat to my surprise, he rang up our old friend Inspector Jap, and asked him if he could possibly come round. No sooner were these proceedings completed than Mrs. Pearson appeared, her eyes as round as saucers. There's a man here from Unwell, from the asylum. Did you ever? Shall I show him up? We signified assent, and a big burly man in uniform was ushered in. Morning, gentlemen, he said cheerfully. I've got reason to believe you've got one of my birds here. Escaped last night, he did. He was here, said Poirot quietly. Not got away again, has he? Asked the keeper, with some concern. He is dead. The man looked more relieved than otherwise. You don't say so. Well, I dare say it's best for all parties. Was he, dangerous? Homicidal, do you mean? Oh, no. Armless enough. Persecution mania very acute. Full of secret societies from China that had got him shut up. They're all the same. I shuddered. How long had he been shut up? Asked Poirot. A matter of two years now. I see, said Poirot quietly. It never occurred to anybody that he might, be sane? The keeper permitted himself to laugh. If he was sane, what would he be doing in a lunatic asylum? They all say they're sane, you know. Poirot said no more. He took the man in to see the body. The identification came immediately. That's him, right enough, said the keeper callously, funny sort of bloke, ain't he? Well, gentlemen, I had best go off now and make arrangements under the circumstances. We won't trouble you with the corpse much longer. If there's a inquest, you will have to appear at it, I dare say. Good morning, sir. With a rather uncouth bow he shambled out of the room. A few minutes later Jap arrived. The Scotland Yard inspector was jaunty and dapper as usual. Here I am Musior Poirot. What can I do for you? Thought you were off to the coral strands of somewhere or other today? My good Jap, I want to know if you have ever seen this man before. He led Jap into the bedroom. The inspector stared down at the figure on the bed with a puzzled face. Let me see now, he seems sort of familiar, and I pride myself on my memory, too. Why, God bless my soul, it's mailing. And who is, or was, mailing? Secret Service chap, not one of our people. Went to Russia five years ago. Never heard of again. Always thought the Bolshies had done him in. It all fits in, said Poirot, when Jap had taken his leave, except for the fact that he seems to have died a natural death. He stood looking down on the motionless figure with a dissatisfied frown. A puff of wind set the window curtains flying out, and he looked up sharply. I suppose you opened the windows when you laid him down on the bed, Hastings? No, I didn't, I replied. As far as I remember, they were shut. Poirot lifted his head suddenly. Shut, and now they are open. What can that mean? Somebody came in that way, I suggested. Possibly, agreed Poirot, but he spoke absently and without conviction. After a minute or two he said. That is not exactly the point I had in mind, Hastings. If only one window was open it would not intrigue me so much. It is both windows being open that strikes me as curious. He hurried into the other room. The sitting room window is open, too. That also we left shut. Ah. He bent over the dead man, examining the corners of the mouth minutely. Then he looked up suddenly. He has been gagged, Hastings. Gagged and then poisoned. Good heavens! I exclaimed, shocked. I suppose we shall find out all about it from the post-mortem. We shall find out nothing. He was killed by inhaling strong prussic acid. It was jammed right under his nose. Then the murderer went away again, first opening all the windows. Hydrocyanic acid is exceedingly volatile, but it has a pronounced smell of bitter almonds. 
with no trace of the smell to guide them, and no suspicion of foul play, death would be put down to some natural cause by the doctors. So this man was in the secret service, Hastings. And five years ago he disappeared in Russia. The last two years he's been in the asylum, I said. But what of the three years before that? Poirot shook his head, and then caught my arm. The clock, Hastings, look at the clock. I followed his gaze to the mantelpiece. The clock had stopped at four o'clock. Mon ami, someone has tampered with it. It had still three days to run. It is an eight-day clock, you comprehend? But what should they want to do that for? Some idea of a fool sent by making the crime appear to have taken place at four o'clock? No, no, rearrange your ideas, mon ami. Exercise your little grey cells. You are mailing. You hear something, perhaps, and you know well enough that your doom is sealed. You have just time to leave a sign. Four o'clock, Hastings. Number four, the destroyer. Ah, an idea. He rushed into the other room and seized the telephone. He asked for Hanwell. You are the asylum, yes. I understand there has been an escape today. What is that you say? A little moment, if you please. Will you repeat that? Ah, parfaitment. He hung up the receiver, and turned to me. You heard, Hastings? There has been no escape. But the man who came, the keeper? I said. I wonder, I very much wonder. You mean? Number four, the destroyer. I gazed at Poirot dumbfounded. A minute or two after, on recovering my voice, I said. We shall know him again, anywhere, that's one thing. He was a man of very pronounced personality. Was he, mon ami? I think not. He was burly and bluff and red-faced, with a thick moustache and a hoarse voice. He will be none of those things by this time, and for the rest, he has nondescript eyes, nondescript ears, and a perfect set of false teeth. Identification is not such an easy matter as you seem to think. Next time. You think there will be a next time? I interrupted. Poirot's face grew very grave. It is a duel to the death, mon ami. You and I on the one side, the big four on the other. They have won the first trick but they have failed in their plan to get me out of the way, and in the future they have to reckon with Hercule Poirot. Chapter 3 We hear more about Li Chang Yen. For a day or two after our visit from the fake asylum attendant I was in some hopes that he might return, and I refused to leave the flat even for a moment. As far as I could see, he had no reason to suspect that we had penetrated his disguise. He might, I thought, return and try to remove the body, but Poirot scoffed at my reasoning. Mon ami, he said, if you wish you may wait in to put salt on the little bird's tail, but for me I do not waste my time so. Well then, Poirot, I argued, why did he run the risk of coming at all? If he intended to return later for the body, I can see some point in his visit. He would at least be removing the evidence against himself, as it is, he does not seem to have gained anything. Poirot shrugged his most Gallic shrug. But you do not see with the eyes of number four, Hastings, he said. You talk of evidence, but what evidence have we against him? True, we have a body, but we have no proof even that the man was murdered, prussic acid, when inhaled, leaves no trace. Again, we can find no one who saw anyone enter the flat during our absence, and we have found out nothing about the movements of our late friend, Mailing. No, Hastings, number four has left no trace, and he knows it. His visit we may call a reconnaissance. Perhaps he wanted to make quite sure that Mailing was dead, but more likely, I think, he came to see Hercule Poirot, and to have speech with the adversary whom alone he must fear. Poirot's reasoning appeared to me typically egotistical, but I forbore to argue. And what about the inquest? I asked. I suppose you will explain things clearly there, and let the police have a full description of number four. And to what end? Can we produce anything to impress a coroner's jury of your solid Britishers? Is our description of number four of any value? No, we shall allow them to call it accidental death, and maybe, although I have not much hope, 
Our clever murderer will pat himself on the back that he deceived Hercule Poirot in the first round. Poirot was right as usual. We saw no more of the man from the asylum, and the inquest, at which I gave evidence, but which Poirot did not even attend, aroused no public interest, as, in view of his intended trip to South America, Poirot had wound up his affairs before my arrival, he had at this time no cases on hand, but although he spent most of his time in the flat that could get little out of him. He remained buried in an armchair, and discouraged my attempts at conversation. And then one morning, about a week after the murder, he asked me if I would care to accompany him on a visit he wished to make. I was pleased, for I felt he was making a mistake in trying to work things out so entirely on his own, and I wished to discuss the case with him. But I found he was not communicative, even when I asked where we were going, he would not answer. Poirot loves being mysterious. He will never part with a piece of information until the last possible moment. In this instance, having taken successively a bus and two trains, and arrived in the neighbourhood of one of London's most depressing southern suburbs, he consented at last to explain matters. We go, Hastings, to see the one man in England who knows most of the underground life of China. Indeed. Who is he? A man you have never heard of, a Mr. John Ingalls. To all intents and purposes, he is a retired civil servant of mediocre intellect, with a house full of Chinese curios with which he bores his friends and acquaintances. Nevertheless, I am assured by those who should know that the only man capable of giving me the information I seek is this same John Ingalls. A few moments more saw us ascending the steps of the laurels, as Mr. Ingalls's residence was called. Personally, I did not notice a laurel bush of any kind, so deduced that it had been named according to the usual obscure nomenclature of the suburbs. We were admitted by an impassive-faced Chinese servant and ushered into the presence of his master. Mr. Ingalls was a squarely built man, somewhat yellow of countenance, with deep-set eyes that were oddly reflective in character. He rose to greet us, setting aside an open letter which he had held in his hand. He referred to it after his greeting. Sit down, won't you? Halsey tells me that you want some information and that I may be useful to you in the matter. That is so, monsieur. I ask of you if you have any knowledge of a man named Li Chang Yen? That's rum, very rum indeed. How did you come to hear about the man? You know him, then? I've met him once. And I know something of him, not quite as much as I should like to but it surprises me that anyone else in England should even have heard of him. He's a great man in his way, Mandarin class and all that, you know, but that's not the crux of the matter. There's good reason to suppose that he's the man behind it all. Behind what? Everything, the worldwide unrest, the labour troubles that beset every nation, and the revolutions that break out in some. There are people, not scaremongers, who know what they are talking about, and they say that there is a force behind the scenes which aims at nothing less than the disintegration of civilization. In Russia, you know, there were many signs that Lenin and Trotsky were mere puppets whose every action was dictated by another's brain. I have no definite proof that would count with you, but I am quite convinced that this brain was Li Chang Yen's. Oh, come, I protested, isn't that a bit far-fetched? How would a Chinaman cut any ice in Russia? Poirot frowned at me irritably. For you, Hastings, he said, everything is far-fetched that comes not from your own imagination, for me, I agree with this gentleman. But continue, I pray, monsieur. What exactly he hopes to get out of it all I cannot pretend to say for certain, went on Mr. Ingalls, but I assume his disease is one that has attacked great brains from the time of Akbar and Alexander to Napoleon, a lust for power and personal supremacy. Up to modern times armed force was necessary for conquest, but in this century of unrest a man like Li Chang Yen can use other means. I have evidence that he has unlimited money behind him for bribery and propaganda, and there are signs that he controls some scientific force more powerful than the world has dreamed of. Poirot was following Mr. Ingalls's words with the closest attention. And in China? He asked. He moves there too? The other nodded in emphatic assent. There, he said, although I can produce no proof that would count in a court of law, I speak from my own knowledge. 
I know personally every man who counts for anything in China today, and this I can tell you, the men who loom most largely in the public eye are men of little or no personality. They are marionettes who dance to the wires pulled by a master hand, and that hand is Li Chang Yen's. His is the controlling brain of the East today. We don't understand the East, we never shall, but Li Chang Yen is its moving spirit. Not that he comes out into the limelight, oh, not at all, he never moves from his palace in Pekin. But he pulls strings, that's it, pulls strings, and things happen far away. And is there no one to oppose him? asked Poirot. Mr. Ingalls leant forward in his chair. Four men have tried in the last four years, he said slowly, men of character, and honesty, and brain power. Any one of them might in time have interfered with his plans. He paused. Well, I queried. Well, they are dead. One wrote an article, and mentioned Li Chang Yen's name in connection with the riots in Pekin, and within two days he was stabbed in the street. His murderer was never caught, the offences of the other two were similar. In a speech or an article, or in conversation, each linked Li Chang Yen's name with rioting or revolution, and within a week of his indiscretion each was dead. One was poisoned, one died of cholera, an isolated case, not part of an epidemic, and one was found dead in his bed. The cause of the last death was never determined, but I was told by a doctor who saw the corpse that it was burnt and shriveled, as though a wave of electrical energy of incredible power had passed through it. And Li Chang Yen? inquired Poirot. Naturally nothing is traced to him, but there are signs, eh? Mr. Ingalls shrugged. Oh, signs, yes, certainly. And once I found a man who would talk, a brilliant young Chinese chemist who was a protege of Li Chang Yen's. He came to me one day, this chemist, and I could see that he was on the verge of a nervous breakdown. He hinted to me of experiments on which he'd been engaged in Li Chang Yen's palace under the Mandarin's direction, experiments on coolies in which the most revolting disregard for human life and suffering had been shown. His nerve had completely broken, and he was in the most pitiable state of terror. I put him to bed in a top room of my own house, intending to question him the next day, and that, of course, was stupid of me. How did they get him? demanded Poirot. But I shall never know. I woke that night to find my house in flames, and was lucky to escape with my life. Investigation showed that a fire of amazing intensity had broken out on the top floor, and the remains of my young chemist friend were charged to a cinder. I could see from the earnestness with which he had been speaking that Mr. Ingalls was a man mounted on his hobby horse, and evidently he, too, realized that he had been carried away, for he laughed apologetically. But, of course, he said, I have no proofs, and you, like the others, will merely tell me that I have a bee in my bonnet. On the contrary, said Poirot quietly, we have every reason to believe your story. We ourselves are more than a little interested in Li Chang Yen. Very odd your knowing about him. Didn't fancy a soul in England had ever heard of him. I'd rather like to know how you did come to hear of him, if it's not indiscreet. Not in the least, monsieur. A man took refuge in my rooms. He was suffering badly from shock, but he managed to tell us enough to interest us in this Li Chang Yen. He described four people, the big four, an organization hitherto undreamed of. Number one is Li Chang Yen, number two is an unknown American, number three an equally unknown Frenchwoman, number four may be called the executive of the organization, the destroyer. My informant died. Tell me, monsieur, is that phrase known to you at all? The big four, not in connection with Li Chang Yen. No, I can't say it is. But I've heard it, or read it, just lately, and in some unusual connection too. Ah, I've got it. He rose and went across to an inlaid lacquer cabinet, an exquisite thing, as even I could see. He returned with a letter in his hand. Here you are. Note from an old seafaring man I ran against once in Shanghai. Hoary old reprobate, maudlin with drink by now, I should say. I took this to be the ravings of alcoholism. He read it aloud. Dear sir, you may not remember me, but you did me a good turn once in Shanghai. Do me another now. 
I must have money to get out of the country. I'm well hid here, I hope, but any day they may get me. The big four, I mean. It's life or death. I've plenty of money, but I daren't get at it, for fear of putting them wise. Send me a couple of hundred in notes. I'll repay it faithful, I swear to that. Your servant, sir. Jonathan Worley. Dated from Granite Bungalow, Hopperton, Dartmoor. I'm afraid I regarded it as rather a crude method of relieving me of a couple of hundred which I can ill spare. If it's any use to you, he held it out. Je vous remercie, monsieur. I start for Hopperton à la même. Dear me, this is very interesting. Supposing I come along too? Any objection? I should be charmed to have your company, but we must start at once. We shall not reach Dartmoor until close on nightfall, as it is. John Ingalls did not delay us more than a couple of minutes, and soon we were in the train moving out of Paddington bound for the West Country. Hopperton was a small village clustering in a hollow right on the fringe of the moorland. It was reached by a nine-mile drive from Morton Hampstead. It was about eight o'clock when we arrived, but as the month was July, the daylight was still abundant. We drove into the narrow street of the village and then stopped to ask our way of an old rustic. Granite bungalow, said the old man reflectively, it be granite bungalow you do want? Eh? We assured him that this was what we did want. The old man pointed to a small grey cottage at the end of the street. There be bungalow. Do you want to see Tinspector? What inspector? Asked Poirot sharply, what do you mean? Haven't ye heard about the murder, then? A shocking business twas seemingly. Pools of blood, they do say. Mon Dieu! murmured Poirot. This inspector of yours, I must see him at once. Five minutes later we were closeted with Inspector Meadows. The inspector was inclined to be stiff at first, but at the magic name of Inspector Jap of Scotland Yard, he unbent. Yes, sir, murdered this morning. A shocking business. They phoned to Morton, and I came out at once. Looked a mysterious thing to begin with, the old man, he was about seventy, you know, and fond of his glass, from all I hear, was lying on the floor of the living room. There was a bruise on his head and his throat was cut from ear to ear. Blood all over the place, as you can understand. The woman who cooks for him, Betsy Andrews, she told us that her master had several little Chinese jade figures, that he'd told her were very valuable, and these had disappeared. That, of course, looked like assault and robbery, but there were all sorts of difficulties in the way of that solution. The old fellow had two people in the house, Betsy Andrews, who is a Hopperton woman, and a rough kind of manservant, Robert Grant. Grant had gone to the farm to fetch the milk, which he does every day, and Betsy had stepped out to have a chat with a neighbour. She was only away twenty minutes, between ten and half past, and the crime must have been done then. Grant returned to the house first. He went in by the back door, which was open, no one locks up doors round here, not in broad daylight, at all events, put the milk in the larder, and went into his own room to read the paper and have a smoke. Had no idea anything unusual had occurred, at least, that's what he says. Then Betsy comes in, goes into the living room, sees what's happened, and lets out a screech to wake the dead. That's all fair and square. Someone got in whilst those two were out, and did the poor old man in. But it struck me at once that he must be a pretty cool customer. He'd have to come right up the village street, or creep through someone's backyard. Granite bungalow has got houses all round it, as you can see. How was it that no one had seen him? The inspector paused with a flourish. Aha, I perceive your point, said Poirot. To continue? Well, sir, fishy, I said to myself, fishy. And I began to look about me. Those jade figures, now. Would a common tramp ever suspect that they were valuable? Anyway, it was madness to try such a thing in broad daylight. Suppose the old man had yelled for help? I suppose, Inspector, said Mr. Ingalls, that the bruise on the head was inflicted before death? Quite right, sir. First knocked him silly, the murderer did, and then cut his throat. That's clear enough. But how the dickens did he come or go? 
they notice strangers quick enough in a little place like this. It came to me all at once, nobody did come. I took a good look round. It had rained the night before, and there were footprints clear enough going in and out of the kitchen. In the living room there were two sets of footprints only, Betsy Andrews stopped at the door, Mr. Worley's, he was wearing carpet slippers, and another man's. The other man had stepped in the blood stains, and I traced his bloody footprints, I beg your pardon, sir, not at all, said Mr. Ingalls, with a faint smile, the adjective is perfectly understood, I traced them to the kitchen, but not beyond. Point number one. On the lintel of Robert Grant's door was a faint smear, a smear of blood. That's point number two. Point number three was when I got hold of Grant's boots, which he had taken off, and fitted them to the marks. That settled it. It was an inside job. I warned Grant and took him into custody, and what do you think I found packed away in his portmanteau? The little jade figures and a ticket of leave. Robert Grant was also Abraham Biggs, convicted for felony and housebreaking five years ago. The inspector paused triumphantly. What do you think of that, gentlemen? I think, said Poirot, that it appears a very clear case, of a surprising clearness, in fact. This Biggs, or Grant, he must be a man very foolish and uneducated, eh? Oh, he is that, a rough, common sort of fellow. No idea of what a footprint may mean. Clearly he reads not the detective fiction. Well, Inspector, I congratulate you. We may look at the scene of the crime. Yes? I'll take you there myself this minute. I'd like you to see those footprints. I, too, should like to see them. Yes, yes, very interesting, very ingenious. We set out forthwith. Mr. Ingalls and the inspector forged ahead. I drew Poirot back a little so as to be able to speak to him out of the inspector's hearing. What do you really think, Poirot? Is there more in this than meets the eye? That is just the question, mon ami. Worley says plainly enough in his letter that the big four are on his track, and we know, you and I, that the big four is no bogey for the children. Yet everything seems to say that this man Grant committed the crime. Why did he do so? For the sake of the little jade figures? Or is he an agent of the big four? I confess that this last seems more likely. However valuable the jade, a man of that class was not likely to realize the fact, at any rate, not to the point of committing murder for them. That, par example, ought to have struck the inspector, he could have stolen the jade and made off with it instead of committing a brutal and quite purposeless murder. Ah, yes, I fear our Devonshire friend has not used his little grey cells. He has measured footprints, and has omitted to reflect and arrange his ideas with the necessary order and method. Chapter 4 The Importance of a Leg of Mutton The inspector drew a key from his pocket and unlocked the door of Granite Bungalow. The day had been fine and dry, so our feet were not likely to leave any prints, nevertheless, we wiped them carefully on the mat before entering. A woman came up out of the gloom and spoke to the inspector, and he turned aside. Then he spoke over his shoulder. Have a good look round, Mr. Poirot, and see all there is to be seen, I'll be back in about ten minutes. By the way, here's Grant's boot. I brought it along with me for you to compare the impressions. We went into the living room, and the sound of the inspector's footsteps died away outside. Ingalls was attracted immediately by some Chinese curios on a table in the corner, and went over to examine them. He seemed to take no interest in Poirot's doings. I, on the other hand, watched him with breathless interest. The floor was covered with a dark green linoleum which was ideal for showing up footprints. A door at the farther end led into the small kitchen. From there another door led into the scullery, where the back door was situated, and another into the bedroom which had been occupied by Robert Grant. Having explored the ground, Poirot commented upon it in a low-running monologue. Here is where the body lay, that big dark stain and the splashes all around mark the spot. Traces of carpet slippers and number nine boots, you observe, but all very confused. Then two sets of tracks leading to and from the kitchen, whoever the murderer was, he came in that way. You have the boot, Hastings? Give it to me. 
he compared it carefully with the prints. Yes, both made by the same man, Robert Grant. He came in that way, killed the old man, and went back to the kitchen. He had stepped in the blood, see the stains he left as he went out? Nothing to be seen in the kitchen, all the village has been walking about in it. He went into his own room, no, first he went back again to the scene of the crime, was that to get the little jade figures? Or had he forgotten something that might incriminate him? Perhaps he killed the old man the second time he went in? I suggested. Maze non, you do not observe. On one of the outgoing footmarks stained with blood there is superimposed an ingoing one. I wonder what he went back for, the little jade figures as an afterthought? It is all ridiculous, stupid. Well, he's given himself away pretty hopelessly. Nespa? I tell you, Hastings, it goes against reason. It offends my little grey cells. Let us go into his bedroom, ah, yes, there is the smear of blood on the lintel and just a trace of footmarks, the blood-stained. Robert Grant's footmarks, and his only, near the body, Robert Grant the only man who went near the house. Yes, it must be so. What about the old woman? I said suddenly. She was in the house alone after Grant had gone for the milk. She might have killed him and then gone out. Her feet would leave no prints if she hadn't been outside. Very good, Hastings. I wondered whether that hypothesis would occur to you. I had already thought of it and rejected it. Betsy Andrews is a local woman, well known hereabouts. She can have no connection with the Big Four, and, besides, old Worley was a powerful fellow, by all accounts. This is a man's work, not a woman's. I suppose the big four couldn't have had some diabolical contrivance concealed in the ceiling, something which descended automatically and cut the old man's throat and was afterwards drawn up again. Like Jacob's ladder? I know, Hastings, that you have an imagination of the most fertile, but I implore of you to keep it within bounds. I subsided, abashed. Poirot continued to wander about, poking into rooms and cupboards with a profoundly dissatisfied expression on his face. Suddenly he uttered an excited yelp, reminiscent of a Pomeranian dog. I rushed to join him. He was standing in the larder in a dramatic attitude. In his hand he was brandishing a leg of mutton. My dear Poirot! I cried. What is the matter? Have you suddenly gone mad? Regard, I pray you, this mutton. But regard it closely. I regarded it as closely as I could, but could see nothing unusual about it. It seemed to me a very ordinary leg of mutton. I said as much. Poirot threw me a withering glance. But do you not see this, and this, and this? He illustrated each this with a jab at the unoffending joint, dislodging small icicles as he did so. Poirot had just accused me of being imaginative, but I now felt that he was far more wildly so than I had ever been. Did he seriously think these slivers of ice were crystals of a deadly poison? That was the only construction I could put upon his extraordinary agitation. It's frozen meat, I explained gently. Imported, you know. New Zealand. He stared at me for a moment or two and then broke into a strange laugh. How marvellous is my friend Hastings! He knows everything, but everything. How do they say, inquire within upon everything? That is my friend Hastings. He flung down the leg of mutton onto its dish again and left the larder. Then he looked through the window. Here comes our friend the inspector. It is well. I have seen all I want to see here. He drummed on the table absent-mindedly, as though absorbed in calculation, and then asked suddenly, What is the day of the week, mon ami? Monday, I said, rather astonished. What? Ah. Monday, is it? A bad day of the week. To commit a murder on a Monday is a mistake. Passing back to the living room, he tapped the glass on the wall and glanced at the thermometer. Set fair, and seventy degrees Fahrenheit. An orthodox English summer's day. Ingalls was still examining various pieces of Chinese pottery. You do not take much interest in this inquiry, monsieur, said Poirot. The other gave a slow smile. It's not my job, you see. 
I'm a connoisseur of some things, but not of this, so I just stand back and keep out of the way. I've learned patience in the East. The inspector came bustling in, apologizing for having been so long away. He insisted on taking us over most of the ground again, but finally we got away. I must appreciate your thousand politenesses, inspector, said Poirot, as we were walking down the village street again. There is just one more request I should like to put to you. You want to see the body, perhaps, sir? Oh, dear me, no. I have not the least interest in the body. I want to see Robert Grant. You will have to drive back with me to Morton to see him, sir. Very well, I will do so. But I must see him and be able to speak to him alone. The inspector caressed his upper lip. Well, I don't know about that, sir. I assure you that if you can get through to Scotland Yard you will receive full authority. I've heard of you, of course, sir, and I know you've done us a good turn now and again. But it's very irregular. Nevertheless, it is necessary, said Poirot calmly. It is necessary for this reason, Grant is not the murderer. What? Who is, then? The murderer was, I should fancy, a youngish man. He drove up to Granite Bungalow in a trap, which he left outside. He went in, committed the murder, came out, and drove away again. He was bareheaded, and his clothing was slightly bloodstained. But, but the whole village would have seen him. Not under certain circumstances. Not if it was dark, perhaps, but the crime was committed in broad daylight. Poirot merely smiled. And the horse and trap, sir, how could you tell that? Any amount of wheeled vehicles have passed along outside. There's no mark of one in particular to be seen. Not with the eyes of the body, perhaps, but with the eyes of the mind, yes. The inspector touched his forehead significantly with a grin at me. I was utterly bewildered, but I had faith in Poirot. Further discussion ended in our all driving back to Morton with the inspector. Poirot and I were taken to Grant, but a constable was to be present during the interview. Poirot went straight to the point. Grant, I know you to be innocent of this crime. Relate to me in your own words exactly what happened. The prisoner was a man of medium height, with a somewhat unpleasing cast of features. He looked a jail bird if ever a man did. Honest to God, I never did it, he whined. Someone put those little glass figures amongst my traps. It was a frame-up, that's what it was. I went straight to my rooms when I came in, like I said. I never knew a thing till Betsy screeched out. Swelp me, God, I didn't. Poirot rose. If you can't tell me the truth, that is the end of it, but, governor. You did go into the room, you did know your master was dead, and you were just preparing to make a bolt of it when the good Betsy made her terrible discovery. The man stared at Poirot with a dropped jaw. Come now, is it not so? I tell you solemnly, on my word of honour, that to be frank now is your only chance. I'll risk it, said the man suddenly. It was just as you say. I came in, and went straight to the master, and there he was, dead on the floor and blood all round. Then I got the wind up proper. They'd ferret out my record, and for a certainty they'd say it was me as had done him in. My only thought was to get away, at once, before he was found. And the jade figures? The man hesitated. You see. You took them by a kind of reversion to instinct, as it were. You had heard your master say that they were valuable, and you felt you might as well go the whole hog. That, I understand. Now, answer me this. Was it the second time that you went into the room that you took the figures? I didn't go in a second time. Once was enough for me. You are sure of that? Absolutely certain. Good. Now, when did you come out of prison? Two months ago. How did you obtain this job? Through one of them prisoners' help societies. Bloke met me when I came out. What was he like? Not exactly a parson but looked like one. Soft black hat and mincing way of talking. Got a broken front tooth. Spectacled chap. Saunders his name was. Said he hoped I was repentant, and that he'd find me a good post. 
I went to Old Worley on his recommendation. Poirot rose once more. I thank you. I know all now. Have patience. He paused in the doorway and added, Saunders gave you a pair of boots, didn't he? Grant looked very astonished. Why, yes, he did. But how did you know? It is my business to know things, said Poirot gravely. After a word or two to the inspector, the three of us went to the White Hart and discussed eggs and bacon and Devonshire cider. Any elucidations yet? asked Ingalls, with a smile. Yes, the case is clear enough now, but, see you, I shall have a good deal of difficulty in proving it. Worley was killed by order of the Big Four, but not by Grant. A very clever man got Grant the post and deliberately planned to make him the scapegoat, an easy matter with Grant's prison record. He gave him a pair of boots, one of two duplicate pairs. The other he kept himself. It was all so simple. When Grant is out of the house, and Betsy is chatting in the village which she probably did every day of her life, he drives up wearing the duplicate boots, enters the kitchen, goes through into the living room, fells the old man with a blow, and then cuts his throat, then he returns to the kitchen, removes the boots, puts on another pair, and, carrying the first pair, goes out to his trap and drives off again. Ingalls looked steadily at Poirot. There's a catch in it still. Why did nobody see him? Ah! That is where the cleverness of number four, I am convinced, comes in. Everybody saw him, and yet nobody saw him. You see, he drove up in a butcher's cart. I uttered an exclamation. The leg of mutton? Exactly, Hastings, the leg of mutton. Everybody swore that no one had been to Granite Bungalow that morning, but, nevertheless, I found in the larder a leg of mutton, still frozen. It was Monday, so the meat must have been delivered that morning, for if on Saturday, in this hot weather, it would not have remained frozen over Sunday. So someone had been to the bungalow, and a man on whom a trace of blood here and there would attract no attention. Damned ingenious! cried Ingalls approvingly. Yes, he is clever, number four. As clever as Hercule Poirot! I murmured my friend threw me a glance of dignified reproach. There are some jests that you should not permit yourself, Hastings, he said sententiously. Have I not saved an innocent man from being sent to the gallows? That is enough for one day. Chapter 5 Disappearance of a Scientist Personally, I don't think that, even when a jury had acquitted Robert Grant, alias Biggs, of the murder of Jonathan Worley, Inspector Meadows was entirely convinced of his innocence. The case which he had built up against Grant, the man's record, the jade which he had stolen, the boots which fitted the footprints so exactly, was to his matter-of-fact mind too complete to be easily upset, but Poirot, compelled much against his inclination to give evidence, convinced the jury. Two witnesses were produced who had seen a butcher's cart drive up to the bungalow on that Monday morning, and the local butcher testified that his cart only called there on Wednesdays and Fridays. A woman was actually found who, when questioned, remembered seeing the butcher's man leaving the bungalow, but she could furnish no useful description of him. The only impression he seemed to have left on her mind was that he was clean-shaven, of medium height, and looked exactly like a butcher's man. At this description Poirot shrugged his shoulders philosophically. It is as I tell you, Hastings, he said to me, after the trial. He is an artist, this one. He disguises himself not with a false beard and the blue spectacles. He alters his features, yes, but that is the least part. For the time being he is the man he would be. He lives in his part. Certainly I was compelled to admit that the man who had visited us from Hanwell had fitted in exactly with my idea of what an asylum attendant should look like. I should never for a moment have dreamt of doubting that he was genuine. It was all a little discouraging, and our experience on Dartmoor did not seem to have helped us at all. I said as much to Poirot, but he would not admit that we had gained nothing. We progress, he said, we progress. At every contact with this man we learn a little of his mind and his methods. Of us and our plans he knows nothing. And there, Poirot, I protested, he and I seem to be in the same boat. You don't seem to me to have any plans, 
you seem to sit and wait for him to do something. Poirot smiled. Mon ami, you do not change. Always the same Hastings, who would be up and at their throats. Perhaps, he added, as a knock sounded on the door, you have here your chance, it may be our friend who enters. And he laughed at my disappointment when Inspector Jap and another man entered the room. Good evening, Musior, said the inspector. Allow me to introduce Captain Kent of the United States Secret Service. Captain Kent was a tall, lean American, with a singularly impassive face which looked as though it had been carved out of wood. Pleased to meet you, gentlemen, he murmured, as he shook hands jerkily. Poirot threw an extra log on the fire, and brought forward more easy chairs. I brought out glasses and the whiskey and soda. The captain took a deep draught, and expressed appreciation. Legislation in your country is still sound, he observed. And now to business, said Jap. Musior Poirot here made a certain request to me. He was interested in some concern that went by the name of the Big Four, and he asked me to let him know at any time if I came across a mention of it in my official line of business. I didn't take much stock in the matter, but I remembered what he said, and when the captain here came over with rather a curious story, I said at once, we'll go round to Musio Poirot's. Poirot looked across at Captain Kent, and the American took up the tale. You may remember reading, Mr. Poirot, that a number of torpedo boats and destroyers were sunk by being dashed upon the rocks off the American coast. It was just after the Japanese earthquake, and the explanation given was that the disaster was the result of a tidal wave. Now, a short time ago, a roundup was made of certain crooks and gunmen, and with them were captured some papers which put an entirely new face upon the matter. They appeared to refer to some organization called the Big Four, and gave an incomplete description of some powerful wireless installation, a concentration of wireless energy far beyond anything so far attempted, and capable of focusing a beam of great intensity upon some given spot. The claims made for this invention seemed manifestly absurd, but I turned them into headquarters for what they were worth, and one of our highbrow professors got busy on them. Now it appears that one of your British scientists read a paper upon the subject before the British Association. His colleagues didn't think great shakes of it, by all accounts, thought it far-fetched and fanciful, but your scientist stuck to his guns, and declared that he himself was on the eve of success in his experiments. A. Eh, bien? demanded Poirot, with interest. It was suggested that I should come over here and get an interview with this gentleman. Quite a young fellow, he is, Halliday by name. He is the leading authority on the subject, and I was to get from him whether the thing suggested was any way possible. And was it? I asked eagerly. That's just what I don't know. I haven't seen Mr. Halliday, and I'm not likely to, by all accounts. The truth of the matter is, said Jap, shortly, Halliday's disappeared. When? Two months ago. Was his disappearance reported? Of course it was. His wife came to us in a great state. We did what we could, but I knew all along it would be no good. Why not? Never is, when a man disappears that way. Chap winked. What way? Paris. So Halliday disappeared in Paris? Yes went over there on scientific work, so he said. Of course, he'd have to say something like that. But you know what it means when a man disappears over there. Either it's Apache work, and that's the end of it, or else it's voluntary disappearance, and that's a great deal the commoner of the two, I can tell you. Gay parry and all that, you know. Sick of home life. Halliday and his wife had had a tiff before he started, which all helps to make it a pretty clear case. I wonder, said Poirot thoughtfully. The American was looking at him curiously. Say, mister, he drawled, what's this big four idea? The big four, said Poirot, is an international organization which has at its head a Chinaman. He is known as number one. Number two is an American. Number three is a Frenchwoman. Number four, the destroyer, is an Englishman. A Frenchwoman, eh? the American whistled. And Halliday disappeared in France. Maybe there's something in this. What's her name? I don't know. I know nothing about her. 
but it's a mighty big proposition, eh? suggested the other. Poirot nodded, as he arranged the glasses in a neat row on the tray. His love of order was as great as ever. What was the idea in sinking those boats? Are the big four a German stunt? The big four are for themselves, and for themselves only, Mr. Le Copitaine. Their aim is world domination. The American burst out laughing, but broke off at the sight of Poirot's serious face. You laugh, monsieur, said Poirot, shaking a finger at him. You reflect not, you use not the little grey cells of the brain. Who are these men who send a portion of your navy to destruction simply as a trial of their power? For that was all it was, monsieur, a test of this new force of magnetical attraction which they hold. Go on with you, Mousior, said Jap good-humouredly. I've read of super-criminals many a time, but I've never come across them. Well, you've heard Captain Kent's story. Anything further I can do for you? Yes, my good friend. You can give me the address of Mrs. Halliday, and also a few words of introduction to her if you will be so kind. Thus it was that the following day saw us bound for Chetwind Lodge, near the village of Chobham in Surrey. Mrs. Halliday received us at once, a tall, fair woman, nervous and eager in manner. With her was her little girl, a beautiful child of five. Poirot explained the purpose of our visit. Oh! Monsieur Poirot, I am so glad, so thankful. I have heard of you, of course. You will not be like these Scotland Yard people, who will not listen or try to understand. And the French police are just as bad, worse, I think. They are all convinced that my husband has gone off with some other woman. But he wasn't like that. All he thought of in life was his work. Half our quarrels came from that. He cared for it more than he did for me. Englishmen, they are like that, said Poirot soothingly. And if it is not work, it is the games, the sport. All those things they take au grand seigneur. Now, madam, recount to me exactly, in detail, and as methodically as you can, the exact circumstances of your husband's disappearance. My husband went to Paris on Thursday, the 20th of July. He was to meet and visit various people there connected with his work, amongst them Madame Olivier. Poirot nodded at the mention of the famous French woman chemist, who had eclipsed even Madame Curie in the brilliance of her achievements. She had been decorated by the French government, and was one of the most prominent personalities of the day. He arrived there in the evening and went at once to the Hotel Costiglione in the Rue de Costiglione. On the following morning, he had an appointment with Professor Bergono, which he kept. His manner was normal and pleasant. The two men had a most interesting conversation, and it was arranged that he should witness some experiments in the professor's laboratory on the following day. He lunched alone at the Café Royal, went for a walk in the boys, and then visited Madame Olivier at her house at Passy. There, also, his manner was perfectly normal. He left about six. Where he dined is not known, probably alone at some restaurant. He returned to the hotel about eleven o'clock and went straight up to his room, after inquiring if any letters had come for him. On the following morning, he walked out of the hotel, and has not been seen again. At what time did he leave the hotel? At the hour when he would normally leave it to keep his appointment at Professor Bergono's laboratory. We do not know. He was not remarked leaving the hotel. But no petit déjeuner was served to him, which seems to indicate that he went out early. Or he might, in fact, have gone out again after he came in the night before, I do not think so. His bed had been slept in, and the night porter would have remembered anyone going out at that hour. A very just observation, madam. We may take it, then, that he left early on the following morning, and that is reassuring from one point of view. He is not likely to have fallen a victim to any Apache assault at that hour. His baggage, now, was it all left behind? Mrs. Halliday seemed rather reluctant to answer, but at last she said, No, he must have taken one small suit case with him. Hmm, said Poirot thoughtfully, I wonder where he was that evening. If we knew that, we should know a great deal. Whom did he meet? There lies the mystery. Madam, myself I do not of necessity accept the view of the police, with them is it always cherche la femme. 
Yet it is clear that something occurred that night to alter your husband's plans. You say he asked for letters on returning to the hotel. Did he receive any? One only, and that must have been the one I wrote him on the day he left England. Poirot remained sunk in thought for a full minute, then he rose briskly to his feet. Well, madam, the solution of the mystery lies in Paris, and to find it I myself journeyed to Paris on the instant. It is all a long time ago, monsieur. Yes, yes. Nevertheless, it is there that we must seek. He turned to leave the room, but paused with his hand on the door. Tell me, madam, do you ever remember your husband mentioning the phrase, the big four? The big four, she repeated thoughtfully. No, I can't say I do. Chapter 6 The Woman on the Stairs That was all that could be elicited from Mrs. Halliday. We hurried back to London, and the following day saw us en route for the continent. With rather a rueful smile, Poirot observed. This big four, they make me to bestir myself, mon ami. I run up and down, all over the ground, like our old friend the human foxhound. Perhaps you'll meet him in Paris, I said, knowing that he referred to a certain Giraud, one of the most trusted detectives of the Certe, whom he had met on a previous occasion. Poirot made a grimace. I devoutly hope not. He loved me not, that one. Won't it be a very difficult task? I asked. To find out what an unknown Englishman did on an evening two months ago. Very difficult, mon ami. But, as you know well, difficulties rejoice the heart of Hercule Poirot. You think the big four kidnapped him? Poirot nodded. Our inquiries necessarily went over old ground, and we learnt little to add to what Mrs. Halliday had already told us. Poirot had a lengthy interview with Professor Bergono, during which he sought to elicit whether Halliday had mentioned any plan of his own for the evening, but we drew a complete blank. Our next source of information was the famous Madame Olivier. I was quite excited as we mounted the steps of her villa at Passy. It has always seemed to me extraordinary that a woman should go so far in the scientific world. I should have thought a purely masculine brain was needed for such work. The door was opened by a young lad of seventeen or thereabouts, who reminded me vaguely of an acolyte, so ritualistic was his manner. Poirot had taken the trouble to arrange our interview beforehand, as he knew Madame Olivier never received anyone without an appointment, being immersed in research work most of the day. We were shown into a small salon, and presently the mistress of the house came to us there. Madame Olivier was a very tall woman, her tallness accentuated by the long white overall she wore, and a coif like a nun's that shrouded her head. She had a long pale face, and wonderful dark eyes that burnt with a light almost fanatical. She looked more like a priestess of old than a modern French woman. One cheek was disfigured by a scar, and I remembered that her husband and co-worker had been killed in an explosion in the laboratory three years before, and that she herself had been terribly burned. Ever since then she had shut herself away from the world, and plunged with fiery energy into the work of scientific research. She received us with cold politeness. I have been interviewed by the police many times, messieurs. I think it hardly likely that I can help you, since I have not been able to help them. Madam, it is possible that I shall not ask you quite the same questions. To begin with, of what did you talk together, you and Mr. Halliday? She looked a trifle surprised. But of his work? His work, and also mine. Did he mention to you the theories he had embodied recently in his paper read before the British Association? Certainly he did. It was chiefly of those we spoke. His ideas were somewhat fantastic, were they not? Asked Poirot carelessly. Some people have thought so. I do not agree. You considered them practicable? Perfectly practicable. My own line of research has been somewhat similar, though not undertaken with the same end in view. I have been investigating the gamma rays emitted by the substance usually known as radium C, a product of radium emanation, and in doing so I have come across some very interesting magnetical phenomena. Indeed, I have a theory as to the actual nature of the force we call magnetism, but it is not yet time for my discoveries to be given to the world. Mr. Halliday's experiments and views were exceedingly interesting to me. 
Poirot nodded. Then he asked a question which surprised me. Madam, where did you converse on these topics? In here? No, monsieur. In the laboratory. May I see it? Certainly, she led the way to the door from which she had entered. It opened on a small passage. We passed through two doors and found ourselves in the big laboratory, with its array of beakers and crucibles and a hundred appliances of which I did not even know the names. There were two occupants, both busy with some experiment. Madame Olivier introduced them. Mademoiselle Claude, one of my assistants. A tall, serious-faced young girl bowed to us. Monsieur Henri, an old and trusted friend. The young man, short and dark, bowed jerkily. Poirot looked round him. There were two other doors besides the one by which we had entered. One, Madame explained, led into the garden, the other into a smaller chamber also devoted to research. Poirot took all this in, then declared himself ready to return to the salon. Madam, were you alone with Mr. Halliday during your interview? Yes, monsieur. My two assistants were in the smaller room next door. Could your conversation be overheard, by them or anyone else? Madam reflected, then shook her head. I do not think so. I am almost sure it could not. The doors were all shut. Could anyone have been concealed in the room? There is the big cupboard in the corner, but the idea is absurd. Part out a fête, madam. One thing more, did Mr. Halliday make any mention of his plans for the evening? He said nothing whatever, monsieur. I thank you, madam, and I apologize for disturbing you. Pray do not trouble, we can find our way out. We stepped out into the hall. A lady was just entering the front door as we did so. She ran quickly up the stairs, and I was left with an impression of the heavy mourning that denotes a French widow. A most unusual type of woman, that, remarked Poirot, as we walked away. Madame Olivier? Yes, she. Mais non, not Madame Olivier. Cela va sans dire. There are not many geniuses of her stamp in the world. No, I referred to the other lady, the lady on the stairs. I didn't see her face, I said, staring. And I hardly see how you could have done. She never looked at us. That is why I said she was an unusual type, said Poirot placidly. A woman who enters her home, for I presume that it is her home since she enters with a key, and runs straight upstairs without even looking at two strange visitors in the hall to see who they are, is a very unusual type of woman, quite unnatural, in fact. Mila Tunnez? What is that? He dragged me back, just in time. A tree had crashed down onto the side walk, just missing us. Poirot stared at it, pale and upset. It was a near thing that. But clumsy, all the same, for I had no suspicion, at least hardly any suspicion. Yes, but for my quick eyes, the eyes of a cat, Hercule Poirot might now be crushed out of existence, a terrible calamity for the world. And you, too, mon ami, though that would not be such a national catastrophe. Thank you, I said coldly. And what are we going to do now? Do? cried Poirot. We are going to think. Yes, here and now, we are going to exercise our little grey cells. This Mr. Halliday now, was he really in Paris? Yes, for Professor Bergono, who knows him, saw and spoke to him. What on earth are you driving at? I cried. That was Friday morning. He was last seen at eleven Friday night, but was he seen then? The porter. A night porter, who had not previously seen Halliday. A man comes in, sufficiently like Halliday, we may trust number four for that, asks for letters, goes upstairs, packs a small suitcase, and slips out the next morning. Nobody saw Halliday all that evening, no, because he was already in the hands of his enemies. Was it Halliday whom Madame Olivier received? Yes, for though she did not know him by sight, an impostor could hardly deceive her on her own special subject. He came here, he had his interview, he left. What happened next? Seizing me by the arm, Poirot was fairly dragging me back to the villa. Now, mon ami, imagine that it is the day after the disappearance, 
and that we are tracking footprints. You love footprints, do you not? See, here they go, a man's, Mr. Halliday's. He turns to the right as we did, he walks briskly, ah. Other footsteps following behind, very quickly, small footsteps, a woman's. See, she catches him up, a slim young woman, in a widow's veil. Pardon, monsieur, Madame Olivier desires that I recall you. He stops, he turns. Now where would the young woman take him? She does not wish to be seen walking with him. Is it coincidence that she catches up with him just where a narrow alleyway opens, dividing two gardens? She leads him down it. It is shorter this way, monsieur. On the right is the garden of Madame Olivier's villa, on the left the garden of another villa, and from that garden, mark you, the tree fell, so nearly on us. Garden doors from both open on the alley. The ambush is there. Men pour out, overpower him, and carry him into the strange villa. Good gracious, Poirot, I cried, are you pretending to see all this? I see it with the eyes of the mind, mon ami. So, and only so, could it have happened. Come, let us go back to the house. You want to see Madame Olivier again? Poirot gave a curious smile. No, Hastings, I want to see the face of the lady on the stairs. Who do you think she is a relation of Madame Olivier's? More probably a secretary, and a secretary engaged not very long ago, the same gentle acolyte opened the door to us. Can you tell me, said Poirot, the name of the lady, the widow lady, who came in just now? Madame Verona? Madame secretary? That is the lady. Would you be so kind as to ask her to speak to us for a moment? The youth disappeared. He soon reappeared. I am sorry. Madame Verona must have gone out again. I think not, said Poirot quietly. Will you give her my name, Mr. Hercule Poirot, and say that it is important I should see her at once, as I am just going to the prefecture? Again our messenger departed. This time the lady descended. She walked into the salon. We followed her. She turned and raised her veil. To my astonishment I recognized our old antagonist, the Countess Rosakoff, a Russian countess, who had engineered a particularly smart jewel robbery in London. As soon as I caught sight of you in the hall, I feared the worst, she observed plaintively. My dear Countess Rosakoff. She shook her head. Inez Verona now, she murmured. A Spaniard, married to a Frenchman. What do you want of me, Mr. Poirot? You are a terrible man. You hunted me from London. Now, I suppose, you will tell our wonderful Madame Olivier about me, and hunt me from Paris. We poor Russians, we must live, you know. It is more serious than that, Madame, said Poirot, watching her. I propose to enter the villa next door, and release Mr. Halliday, if he is still alive. I know everything, you see. I saw her sudden pallor. She bit her lip. Then she spoke with her usual decision. He is still alive, but he is not at the villa. Come, monsieur, I will make a bargain with you. Freedom for me, and Mr. Halliday, alive and well, for you. I accept, said Poirot. I was about to propose the same bargain myself. By the way, are the big four your employers, madam? Again I saw that deathly pallor creep over her face, but she left his question unanswered. Instead, you permit me to telephone? She asked, and crossing to the instrument she rang up a number. The number of the villa, she explained, where our friend is now imprisoned. You may give it to the police, the nest will be empty when they arrive. Ah! I am through. Is that you, André? It is I, Inez. The little Belgian knows all. Send Halliday to the hotel, and clear out. She replaced the receiver, and came towards us, smiling. You will accompany us to the hotel, madam. Naturally. I expected that. I got a taxi, and we drove off together. I could see by Poirot's face that he was perplexed. The thing was almost too easy. We arrived at the hotel. The porter came up to us. A gentleman has arrived. He is in your rooms. He seems very ill. A nurse came with him, but she has left. That is all right, 
said Poirot, he is a friend of mine. We went upstairs together. Sitting in a chair by the window was a haggard young fellow who looked in the last stages of exhaustion. Poirot went over to him. Are you John Halliday? The man nodded. Show me your left arm. John Halliday has a mole just below the left elbow. The man stretched out his arm. The mole was there. Poirot bowed to the countess. She turned and left the room. A glass of brandy revived Halliday somewhat. Thank you for listening to today's episode I really hoped you enjoyed it. There will be more to come, please subscribe not to miss out on what is next. I will be looking forward to your return. The music is by Madfan from Pixabay. To support this and other artists go to pixabay.com. Sheila